He has laid out a plan that would pay down the debt of the United States. I don't see it. I don't think it's close. I thank the chair and would yield the floor and note the absence of quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kaka.
这样见证。
present. The Senator from Montana. Mr. President, I ask that further proceedings on the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. George Washington once said, the willingness of future generations to serve in our military will be directly dependent upon how we have treated those we have served in the past. Tomorrow, 95 World War II veterans will fly from Montana to Washington to see their memorial with their own eyes for the first time. This trip is made possible by the Big Sky Honor Flight Program. Their mission is to recognize American veterans by flying them to Washington, D.C. to see their memorial at no cost. These veterans and the volunteers who helped send them here say a lot about what makes the United States of America the greatest country on earth. Who are these veterans? Their average age is 90. They hail from all parts of our state, from Plentywood to Superior, from Isle City to Libby, and many places in between. And each veteran has a story to tell. Shortly after the attack on Pearl Harbor, Bill Smith left his job as an accountant in Billings and volunteered to fly B-24 Liberator bombers with the 466th Bomb Group. Bill went on to fly 30 missions over Europe from 1943 to 1945. He rose to the ranks and eventually took command of an entire crew. On a typical day, Bill and his crew would rise at 4 a.m., eat a quick breakfast, and receive a mission brief. As crew commander, Bill was responsible for seeing to it that the bomber safely navigated enemy airspace, accomplished its mission on time, on target, and returned to base safely. Bill's B-24 flew at 22,000 feet in sub-zero temperatures in non-pressurized cabins. Just think about that. We aren't talking about the cozy airplane cabins you and I are used to today. We're talking about open air, really loud and really cold cabins. Now imagine, if you can, doing all that with Nazi fighters on your tail. In one instance, incoming enemy fire shot the oxygen mask right off of the face of one of the gunners on Bill's crew. Bill is 96 now. When asked about his service, he said, I am proud of what we did. I know we hit a lot of targets. That's what we were there for. We weren't there for a joyride. In March, I had the privilege of meeting Del Olson from Billings. Del was born and raised on a farm in Rapple, J, Montana, a very small town. In 1944, Del joined the Women's Army Corps as an airplane mechanic. The Women's Army Corps was the first female unit, besides nurses, to serve within the ranks of the United States Army. They were patriots, trailblazers, and like all trailblazers, their service didn't come without controversy. But Dell didn't let the controversy get in the way of her mission. She dedicated herself to fixing up bomber aircraft in Texas. That was her job, including the B-24 Liberator that Bill Smith was flying over Europe. Later in the war, Dell moved to Bakersfield, California, where she worked as a nurse caring for the countless wounded warriors. Now at age 92, when you ask Dell about her service, she will tell you, I didn't do much during the war. Others did so much more. Dell's humility is a testament to what real selfless service looks like. When Dell visits the World War II Memorial, she plans to pay her respects to those who made the ultimate sacrifice during the war. Dell said she will think of her brothers and her sister, who all served under General Eisenhower in Europe. She especially wants to honor her first and second husbands, both of whom served in the South Pacific during the war. I met with Dell and talked with her about coming to Washington, D.C. on the honor flight. She was such a special, and is such a special lady. When I talked to her, I says, boy, Dell, we've got to make sure that 
they raise enough money so you get a seat in the plane. She says, oh, no, no, not me. There are others who are so much more deserving than I. Not me. Exactly the kind of selfless attitude that she had and others who served World War II had. She now has a seat. She's got, she'll be back here in Washington, D.C., and their first event is, to, is tomorrow night and it's with a service or at the memorial tomorrow. But honor flights just don't happen automatically. It takes work, a lot of work. Kathy Shannon, Beth Boley, Tina Vothier, Chris Reinhardt, Vicki Stevens, Yellowstone County Commissioner Bill Kennedy, and countless other volunteers have all been instrumental in organizing Montana's first honor flight. Students, friends, neighbors, and businesses pulled together more than $150,000 to make this happen. In today's tough times when families are struggling to make ends meet, pulling together that kind of contribution is no small feat. This will be the first honor flight from Montana, but I know it won't be the last. I know because I've seen the passion and dedication of these volunteers firsthand. In March, I had the incredible opportunity to pitch in by serving burgers at a fundraiser in Billings. It was a lot of fun. It was very inspiring seeing all these folks. Inspiring to see our young Montanans as well demonstrate their spirit of service. For example, students from Huntley Project Schools raised an amazing $2,425 to make this flight happen. Just kids. And in the process, they learned invaluable lessons about the sacrifices that made it possible for them to grow up in a country strong and free. This honor flight visit is larger than just a thank you to our World War II veterans. It shows the commitment we Americans consider a sacred obligation to all our veterans. For those who served on the frozen battlefields of Korea, to the jungles of Vietnam, to the deserts of Iraq, and to those who on this very day are fighting in the mountains of Afghanistan. So I ask the Senator to join me in welcoming these heroes to our nation's capital this weekend, and a special thanks to all 18,000 World War II veterans living in Montana. We are forever grateful for your service and your sacrifice. And I might add, Mr. President, as we honor our veterans, especially those who served World War II, it's a good reminder to all of us here who aspire the public service to provide the service at least that they did as veterans, who in many cases were putting themselves in harm's way, sacrificing themselves for our country. The very least we can do here in the Senate is to remember our veterans who sacrificed so much, remember our armed forces today who serve us so well, and at the very least let's work together as a, as a, as a, as a Senate, as a Congress, uh, to solve a lot of the problems that are ahead of us and not just be so partisan and so divisive, which is clearly not public service. Mr. President, before I conclude, I also want to say a few words on another very important topic impacting our democracy. That is the freedom of the people to choose their own elected representatives. Today, the Supreme Court is considering a challenge to Montana's 1912 Corrupt Practices Act. 100 years ago, Montanans said, in passing legislation, elections should not be bought by the Copper Kings. Now, who are the Copper Kings? Well, basically, they're three very wealthy corporate titans trying to control the copper production in the state of Montana, and they virtually controlled our state. Montana says, no, elections should not be bought by the Copper Kings or by any corporation. Today, we in Montana say the same thing. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court's 2010 decision in Citizens United cleared the way for unlimited out-of-state corporate donations throughout the country. I applaud Montana's Attorney General Steve Bullock for sticking up for Montanans as the Supreme Court takes a closer look at this case. I have introduced a constitutional amendment to limit corporate campaign expenditures and I've supported every piece of campaign reform legislation that's come before me. 
As the Supreme Court looks at Montana's 1912 Corrupt Practices Act today, it's my hope that Montana can continue to lead the nation in saying elections belong in the hands of the people, not out of state or in corporations. Mr. President, I yield the floor to suggest the opposite quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Okaka.
President. Senator from Delaware. Mr. President, I ask uh, unanimous consent that the uh, quorum call be vitiated. Without objection. Thank, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, a week or so ago, I was uh, being interviewed uh, by CNN, and I think it was the, uh, a, a couple of days after the jobs report had come out for the, uh, for the month of, of May. And the, uh, the reporter who was uh, interviewing me was uh, commenting on those job numbers, which were, were disappointing, I think, to, to all of us. And asked if this me we're back in a super, we're going to have a right back into a recession instead of continue to recover from a, a really deep, uh, awful recession, awfully hard, tough recession, that uh, we would, you know, back go back into the soup. And uh, and I said uh, to uh, to her, I said, I know that uh, there are people in my state, I know there are people across the country that are that are still hurting, uh, suffering. People have lost jobs. Uh, too many cases, people lost their homes. They're fearful of losing their, their health care, not be able to maybe send their, their son or daughter back to, uh, to school. And I realize there's that pain uh, uh, still in, in our country more than, than any of us would like. But I said uh, maybe four things we should keep in mind. One is, is let's not talk ourselves back into another recession, which we have the ability to do. Our hair is not on fire. Uh, let's uh, continue to, to make sure that we're looking at the underlying fundamentals of uh, the economy. And, while they're not universally uh, up or upbeat, uh, the underlying fundamentals are not uh, entirely bad either. Uh, our energy costs are down, way down, where the, not just the Saudi Arabia of coal, or the Saudi Arabia of natural gas, we're now a net export of oil, and we're seeing significant reductions over the last half dozen or so years, and our dependence on foreign oil from about 60% of the oil that we used uh, being from foreign sources to, we're approaching 40%. And so the movement is right. We, Another uh, underlying factor is the, uh, the cost of health care in this country for years have seen double digit increases in, in the rate of, of health care costs in this uh, country. And last year, the health care costs in this country rose, but only by, by 4%. And that's a, a positive factor as we uh, try to be more competitive with the rest of the world. Uh, the, uh, another, uh, another factor is the, the uh, if you will, the, uh, the disparity, the difference in, in labor costs between our country and and those of, of other countries with whom we compete, and one of them China, uh, another one, believe it or not, uh, Vietnam, who a uh, very low cost producer of manufactured products. And what we've seen in those other countries, in uh, Vietnam, China, and, and, and some of the other Asian uh, uh, countries, their uh, wage levels have come up, and our wage levels in this country pretty much remain the same. And as a result, the, uh, the inducement for companies here, particularly manufacturing companies to offshore, uh, the uh, manufacturing operations are diminished than from where they were a couple of years ago. Those are all, uh, I think, encouraging factors and began to, to lay the groundwork for, for uh, a sustained economic recovery as our friends in Europe can work their way through, navigate their way through their, uh, their problems in places like uh, Greece and, and Spain. Uh, but uh, it's not all bad news. It's not all bad news. And in, in the near term, what should we do? Again, number one, not talk ourselves back into uh, a recession. Number two, uh, prepare to hit a home run. And I'm a, uh, a guy who likes baseball a lot, and uh, we, uh, we need to hit a home run. I don't think we're going to hit a home run here in this chamber, in this building, in this uh, city, uh, maybe before the election. But the best thing, in my view, that we could do for the, the economy is to, uh, to, to adopt a bipartisan comprehensive deficit reduction deal, much like that proposed by the Deficit Commission, uh, led by Erskine Bowles, former Chief of Staff to President Clinton, and by former U.S. Senator from Wyoming Republican uh, Alan Simpson, so-called Bowles-Simpson Deficit Reduction uh, Plan that uh, provides for 4 to $5 trillion of deficit, of deficit reduction over the next 10 years, $3 on the spending side for every $1 on the revenue side. I think that's uh, lower, actually lowers tax rates, both corporate and individual rates, lowers the rates, broadens the base of the income that is taxable by eliminating about half of our so-called uh, tax uh, exemptions, tax breaks, tax deductions, tax credits, tax loopholes, and that's how we end up with uh, lower rates, both on the corporate and individual side, and, and also why, uh, with uh, actually creating some revenue, one dollar revenue, new revenue, for every three dollars of uh, spending reduction. Uh, that is a home run, and I don't know that we're going to do that, hit that home run before the election, but sometime between the day after the election, and hopefully by the end of the year, we will adopt something similar to, to that and provide certainty. One, can we govern? Yes, we can. Two, can we be fiscally responsible? Yes, we can. Three, can we provide certainty with respect to our tax code? Yes, we can. And I think the adoption of that kind of plan answers all those, uh, all those questions with, with yes, we can, and, and, and we are.
So, but while we prepare to hit a home run, we don't wait. I don't think we ought to wait around here till the end of the year to, to do something. And in the meantime, we need to hit a lot of singles. So rather than hitting a home run with uh, runners on base, let's see if we can't hit some singles, maybe a couple of doubles, and score some runs for the economy. And I spent a lot of time, as my colleagues will tell uh, folks, uh, focusing on how do we create a more nurturing environment here for job creation and job preservation. How do we do that? And uh, our friend uh, John uh, Chambers, from, uh, who actually from West Virginia, native of West Virginia is MI, uh, but uh, John Chambers, who now heads up Cisco, a big technology company, likes to say the jobs in the 21st century will go to those uh, uh, states, those countries that do two things especially well. One, uh, productive work workforce, students who can read, write, think, do math, science coming out of our high schools, out of our colleges and universities into the workforce. And uh, the states and nations that do another thing very well, and that's create a, uh, a world-class infrastructure broadly defined, roads, highways, bridges, transit, rail, port, uh, airports, water, wastewater treatment, broadband, all of the above, broadly defined uh, infrastructure. But in addition to that, there's a, a number of other things we can do to provide a nurturing environment, and they include uh, cost-effective uh, regulations, common sense regulations, access to uh, uh, leaders like us. Another, uh, another uh, positive element in job creation, job preservation, access to capital, the ability to actually borrow money for businesses large and small at, at uh, reasonable rates. Uh, the ability to, to export into foreign markets and to get financing for those exports if they need it. Uh, incentives to uh, do research, basic research and development that actually can be uh, commercialized and create products that we can sell around, around the world. Uh, those are some of the things that, uh, that actually contribute to a nurturing environment, not all, uh, not the only thing, but some of them. Uh, the, uh, the other thing that we can do in terms of hitting singles and doubles is some things we've done in this chamber this year, in this chamber this year. I want to mention a few of those. Uh, and they include uh, actually doing something about uh, our aviation, aviation infrastructure. And when we passed the uh, FAA, Federal Aviation uh, Administration, reauthorization uh, earlier this year, we not only uh, provided for a source of revenues provided by the general aviation community and the uh, uh, civilian airlines here, uh, source of revenues to upgrade, modernize, improve uh, airports. We also provided money to uh, bring our analog air traffic control system uh, into the 21st century, uh, an analog system into the, into, uh, the 21st century and arguably a digital system. That's a one in terms of a more nurturing environment. Number two, I actually said uh, the idea that that in the past, uh, if someone comes up with an idea, like this young woman right here who's typing down the, my words uh, uh, on the floor today, but uh, if she comes up with a good idea, goes to the patent office, and in the past, she can go to the patent office and say, I have a, a great idea, maybe for a, a better machine than the one that she's taking down my words with here today, and uh, files for a patent on that machine. Uh, a year later, I show up at the patent office and say, no, 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 that was really my uh, idea, my, uh, uh, and I, I thought of it first. She just, file first, but I really had it first. And I end up going and litigating with her, and it may string out for months, years, and provides a lot of uncertainty. I'm a patent troll. I just want to be bought out. So, and basically paid off in some cases. Maybe I did have the idea first, but in a lot of cases I didn't. And I uh, just uh, I want to be given something in financial consequences, so I'll go away. And we've changed that now. And with the law that we passed here, the president has signed, it says, uh, Whoever files first, she files first for that new machine, it's hers. That's her patent. And it's a, a real important thing for us to do with respect to providing certainty for innovation and creativity. Another thing that we did here, I think, a smart idea is we, we said we, we're having a hard time selling our goods and services in places like South Korea, places like Panama and Colombia, and a lot of others around the world, but we negotiated in the Bush administration, George W. Bush, and uh, further in the Obama administration, free trade agreements with South Korea with Panama and with uh, Colombia. Uh, they've been approved by the, uh, the Senate, it's, uh, agreed to by the President, and they're now the law of our lands and, and the lands of those three countries. What does it mean for us? South Korea, a place where they sold to us last year 500,000 cars, trucks, and vans, 500,000. Uh, a country we sold 5,000 cars, trucks, and vans to. And uh, that's going to change. And their ability to keep our vehicles out will phase out over time, and we'll have uh, the opportunity to, to uh, sell our vehicles there just as they have the ability to sell the vehicles here. We'll have the ability to sell poultry products. We raise a lot of uh, poultry on the Delmarva Peninsula in Delaware, 
or have the ability to sell poultry products down into countries like Panama and Colombia without impediment, tariff barriers to keep them out. Uh, we've, uh, so the idea to provide better access to foreign markets, we've done that at least with respect to those three, and we're trying to negotiate now something called the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which would involve a number of countries in this hemisphere, uh, including us, and maybe uh, Chile and a couple of other countries uh, to the south of us, maybe even Canada and Mexico, creating a trading partnership with countries like, oh, that's like Malaysia, Australia, New Zealand, Vietnam, a couple of other countries over there. I'm told the Japanese are, are interested in being part of that as well. That could be an enormous uh, new uh, global partnership that would enhance trade between all the, the countries that are a part of that. Another piece of legislation to grow a single that, uh, that we've had over here is a, something called the Jobs Act. And you may re recall it, uh, I IPO on-ramp for initial public offering, uh, changing the shareholder threshold, raising it from 500 shareholders to 2,000, something I worked on. The IPO uh, on-ramp for, make it easier for companies to, if they want to uh, go public, they can do that. And uh, John Carney, our congressman from Delaware, worked on that in the House, did a very nice job. But that's uh, legislation endorsed by the President, supported by Democrats and Republicans. It's now the law of the land, another single, maybe a double, I don't know, for companies, uh, middle-sized companies, smaller companies that want to grow, either remain uh, private, privately held or, or become uh, publicly traded. Other uh, potential singles and doubles are uh, the uh, postal legislation that uh, Senator Lieberman, uh, Senator Collins, uh, Senator Brown, myself, and others have worked on to try to save the Postal Service, which is losing $25 million a day, and it's here in the 21st century. We've got a pretty good idea how to stem that uh, hemorrhaging and how to help them help themselves become sustainable again in a break-even operation. Uh, that legislation, bipartisan bill, passed the Senate over in the House, waiting action. We need for the House to take up that legislation. They do. That's uh, something that could help uh, save, preserve seven, eight million jobs and affect a significant part of our economy. Another uh, potential double, I don't think it's the same, maybe, maybe a double, maybe even a triple, is uh, transportation legislation. Two or three million jobs that flow from that. A lot of transportation projects in my state and 49 other states are literally grinding to a halt because of uh, the inability, in this case, of the House to agree with uh, bipartisan legislation that we passed here in the Senate to uh, fund and to go forward with transportation projects in all 50 states that nobody's arguing with. They're not bridges to nowhere. They're actually smart, smart ideas. And uh, a lot of them involve state funding as well, but they need, they need a federal, some federal help. Uh, we passed it. The, Senate, the House has sort of gone to conference with us, but we're having a tough time getting to yes with them, they need to get to yes. If we do, that's a, a double or a triple with runners on base, two to three million jobs. Those are all things that we can do to, to actually enhance the nurturing environment uh, for uh, economic growth, for job uh, creation, job preservation in, in, this, in, this, uh, in this state. There's one more uh, single or double that I want to talk about, and it's uh, agriculture uh, legislation. We have an agriculture bill that's been brought out of a committee by a big bipartisan vote. It would uh, enable us uh, to get, uh, to do what I think we need to do in, in a lot of areas of our government, that's get better results for less money. And uh, I like to say in everything we do, everything I do, I know I can do better. I think the same is true of my 99 colleagues. I believe uh, that's uh, true of most federal programs. And one of our challenges is to figure out how do we get better results for everything we do. Today we had a, a, a very interesting hearing on uh, Medicaid program and how do we get better results for less money with respect to Medicaid, how do we reduce improper payments, mistakes and so forth, how do we reduce fraud losses which are about 10 percent of what they spend in Medicaid and in, in Medicare. But a recurring theme for, for me and from the subcommittee I, I lead on federal financial management here in the Senate is that how do we get better results in almost everything we do for less money or better results for the same amount of, of money. That's not a Democratic idea, it's not a Republican idea, it's not a liberal idea or a conservative idea, it's just a smart idea. In a day and age of these trillion dollar deficits, and deficits coming down, but it's still too high, and, and while we wait to do that big deal, uh, hit that home run with something like the Lowell Simpson Deficit Commission uh, recommendation later this year, we need to continue to hit singles in terms of reducing uh, spending and spending our money, or taxpayer money, in a, in a smarter, more cost-effective way. And, and that, that brings us to the legislation that has been before the Senate this week, and that's the Agriculture Bill. We, believe it or not, Delaware, a little state, we have fewer than a million people, about 100 miles from one end to the other, north-south, right here on the mid-Atlantic between, uh, between Washington, D.C. And, and New York, uh, New York City. 
uh, we, for us, uh, agriculture is still a big deal. And uh, we don't raise, uh, we don't have a lot of cows, we have some. Uh, we don't have a lot of uh, hogs, we have some. Uh, what we have a lot of is chickens, a lot of chickens. And for every person who lives in my state, uh, Mr. President, you're not going to believe this, but there are 300 chickens. And as you go from uh, north to south, the chickens are in, have us outnumbered even more than 300 to 1. Eighty percent of our agricultural economy in Delaware is uh, poultry related. And the poultry bill, uh, the poultry industry doesn't need a lot or ask for a lot of in terms of support or investment from the federal government, but uh, we raise a lot of corn and soybeans in, uh, in Delaware. And uh, so we care about agriculture and we care about the farm bill. Other parts of the country care about it even more maybe than, than, than we do. But I, I want to talk uh, for a few more minutes, if I can, Mr. Mr. President, and, and I'll uh, head, uh, head back to my, uh, my office. But uh, I'm, I'm here today to say that uh, the Farm Bill that's been before us this, this week, uh, when compared to the ones that have come before it in, in recent years, takes great stride toward reforming a process that was too often, I think rightly criticized, is regressive and uh, unfortunately wasteful. All told, the bill that's uh, been brought to the floor, a bipartisan bill, uh, great kudos to the chairman of the Agricultural Committee in the Senate, uh, Debbie Stabenow of Michigan, and uh, the ranking Republican, Senator Pat Roberts from uh, Kansas. They've done great work in steering this legislation through committee, again with strong bipartisan support and bringing it to the floor, saving the federal government about almost $24 billion over the next 10 years compared to what we'd otherwise be spending under current law. The legislation eliminates wasteful spending by getting rid of the so-called direct payments program, which too often gave money to farmers even when farmers didn't grow anything uh, or even own the land. Uh, but the bill uh, is also, I think, humane, and this legislation is uh, not unfair to our farmers. I believe it embraces the golden rule of treating other people the way we want to be treated, and that includes farmers and farm families and taxpayers. But instead of continuing the direct payments program that has prevailed for years, this legislation institutes a new crop insurance program, a long sought after goal by those of us wanting to make progressive changes to farm bill, farm law. And instead of giving money to farmers that, again, sometimes don't grow even a single crop uh, in a year, this legislation only helps farmers when they actually experience a loss on the crops they are actually growing. Now, for a lot of people in this country, that would just sound like common sense. But here in, uh, in Washington, D.C., and across the country, it's an uncommon uh, approach to farm legislation. It's a much smarter approach. And in the end, the new crop insurance program in this uh, bill, the Ag Bill, for the Senate this week, still would give farmers the security they need to continue farming. There's a lot of uncertainty in farming. Uh, is it going to rain? Is it going to be cold? Is it going to, we're going to have uh, hail? Uh, we're going to have drought? There's a huge amount of uncertainty. And uh, it's important for, for us, to the, to the extent that we can reasonably do that, re reduce uncertainty and lack of predictability for all kinds of businesses. It's hard to do that. We don't control the weather. We don't control the temperature. Well, sort of indirectly, maybe. But uh, the, uh, uh, to the extent that we can help uh, provide some certainty and security and predictability for the farmers uh, at a lower cost to the taxpayers, we ought to do that. And uh, I think this committee has pretty well thought that through. And, figured out a way to do crop insurance, an old program with a, a new, uh, new approach, a smarter approach that's good for farmers and I think good for taxpayers. Another thing that this legislation focuses on is uh, nutrition and how we can encourage farmers to grow and people to eat more, health, uh, more healthful foods as part of their daily diets. Uh, we live in a country where sadly a, a third of uh, the, uh, the American uh, people are uh, overweight uh, or over the, on the way to being uh, overweight, really maybe on the way to being obese, about a third of us. And the trend is not good. It's uh, in terms of uh, cost for health care, it is killing us. Medicaid, Medicaid costs, dialysis, diabetes, um, hospitalization, loss of limbs, loss of eyesight. Uh, it is, uh, and for our ability to, to fund Medicare, again, the same kind of challenges and hardships and the ability us to compete with the rest of the world when we are so much uh, heavier uh, than they are. And we know the four major, major uh, cost drivers in, in health care are one, weight, uh, two, uh, tobacco use, 
three, high blood pressure, four, or high cholesterol. If we could do a better job on all those four fronts, we would be off to the races in this country in terms of reining in our health care costs. And we're making some progress, but uh, we're bringing health care costs down. But the, uh, this, believe it or not, this agricultural legislation is part of the solution uh, because it, uh, among other things, uh, encourages us to eat uh, a diet that is more healthy for, for, for us. This bill doesn't mandate what people eat, but it helps to encourage and provide ways to, to make uh, healthier foods available, nutritious foods available in places like health deserts where some communities, some cities around the country where the only grocery store they have in their community is like a convenience store. And there's nothing wrong with convenience stores, but when that's the only place you have to go buy fruits and vegetables and they don't have them, maybe a banana if you're lucky, that ain't good. And uh, this uh, legislation, along with the efforts of our first lady, uh, Michelle Obama, are going to try to reduce the number of those food, uh, food deserts. But this bill uh, includes support for programs that help farmers bring fresh fruits and vegetables. And in our state, we raise, grow not just corn and soybeans, we raise a lot of uh, fruits and vegetables, the most notable are watermelons, but we do lima beans and a whole lot of other things as, as well. But uh, we uh, grow a bunch of those mostly in the summer, and some in the fall and the spring, but we'll be able to bring them to market in ways that benefits farmers and consumers. And also make uh, uh, support programs like uh, Farm to School, where we actually bring fresh fruits and vegetables from our farms and uh, bring them actually to schools to feed, uh, feed our students. Uh, we also talk uh, a lot around here, as my, my colleagues know, about reducing our dependence on foreign oil. As I said earlier, Mr. President, uh, dependence on foreign oil in this country has dropped from about six years ago or so, about a half dozen years ago. We're at 60 percent of our oil was from foreign sources. Now we're trending down toward 40 percent. We'll hopefully be there in a, another year or two. But this uh, legislation, the Ag Bill, actually helps move us in that direction. We're a lessening our dependence on foreign oil. It includes legislation I joined Senator Stabenow in introducing earlier this year that would support the expansion of products made in this country from bio-based materials, like the renewable chemicals made from plant material, which can be used to displace petroleum in our plastics. The DuPont Company, which is a major employer in our state and frankly one of the great the companies in this country for the last 200 years and around the world, uh, does uh, great work, exciting work, not only in figuring out how to use corn, get more yield off of an acre of land, as much as 300 bushels of corn off an acre of land. 30 years ago, you're doing good at, at farmers doing good at 50 bushels off an acre of land. DuPont has these experimental farms, Mr. President, where they're getting 300 bushels of corn off an acre of land, showing that we can feed ourselves and fuel ourselves. And the, uh, not only the, to take like the corn holdings, the, Corn holders, you know, the corn stalks, the leaves, the corn cobs, and turn that into cellulosic ethanol. But also to take uh, the uh, the byproduct of uh, some of the some of the uh, vegetables and some of the plants that we're we're, we're raising to create uh, carpeting. It's just as attractive as the carpeting here in this uh, this chamber to create clothing. And one of the great growth businesses for for Dupont, at least, is using um, plant life to create carpets. You not to have to depend on petroleum to be able to, uh, to do that. It's very exciting and reduces our dependence on oil, particularly on foreign oil. But, uh, and it also creates new jobs in communities across our country, including uh, my state and I suspect including Minnesota, where our presiding officer is from. Another key investment that this bill continues, although at a somewhat reduced federal level uh, from what we saw in the 2008 Farm Bill, is the bill's uh, agriculture bill's investment in, in conservation. Uh, conservation and the preservation of our agricultural lands are, are key to the future of agriculture in every state, but are especially uh, uh, important in a little state like, uh, like Delaware. And these conservation investments are also particularly critical to regions like the Chesapeake Bay to our west, which Delawareans and Marylands and Virginians especially are, are working hard to restore and, and to, uh, to protect. I might, uh, I might mention here uh, if I could, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, in terms of conservation, we had a, a big problem in our state. Uh, people like to come to Delaware. We have great beaches, and, you know, in Cape Penelope and in Lewis and Rehoboth and Dewey and Bethany on down to Fenwick Island. Um, 
people come to our state a lot of times because they want to retire there. Maybe they have a beach house in the summer and then they decide when they retire they want to come and live in, in Delaware. And we've had like a lot of demand for housing in the southern part of our state crowding out some of our ag land. And uh, with real concerns about what does that do for open spaces and preserving uh, ag land. So we launched, uh, when I was privileged to be governor, right a program initially proposed by Mike Castle, uh, for a previous governor, to preserve uh, uh, ag land. And we've invested uh, a fair amount of uh, tax dollars in Delaware with broad support from people who live in suburbs and cities as well as in the farms to preserve farmland. And for a little place we've uh, preserved a lot of it. I'm very proud of that. But one of the best ways to preserve uh, farmland is to make sure that farmers can make money off the land they're farming. And if they're able to make a good income, good years and, and bad years, uh, if they have ways to get extra sources of income from the farms, which include the raising uh, corn that can be turned to a cellulosic biofuel and help uh, fuel our country, or provide the, uh, the materials that are needed to, uh, to create carpeting or, or clothing, uh, or to, uh, to be a, a place that uh, we can build maybe windmill farms or solar energy uh, and deploy those and, and harvest that as well as, as the crops. Those are, are ways to supplement the income of our farmers and to promote conservation. But beyond that, the bill that we're uh, looking at does uh, focus some good attention, appropriate attention, on, on encouraging uh, and nurturing conservation. I, I mentioned earlier in Delaware we have um, about a million people. For every person in Delaware we've got about three, uh, 300 chickens. About 60% of the cost, I'm told, of, of, of raising a chicken is the cost of uh, a feed. And in recent years, the cost of feed, including the cost of corn, has risen dramatically. Uh, our new pages here, who are here for a three-week period, are anxious to know um, how much it costs to feed a chicken. You can actually take a chicken from the time it comes out of a, uh, an egg in about seven weeks or so. It's ready to actually go to market. But um, what do we feed them in the meantime? We feed them a lot of corn, and we feed them a lot of soybeans. And the, we've seen the cost of corn go from maybe a couple of bu bucks for a bushel of corn and to rise to as much as seven or eight dollars for a bushel of corn. We've seen soybean go from maybe about five bucks a bushel to as high as 12 or 13 dollars per bushel. It's hard to pay that kind of money for corn and soybeans and to, uh, to feed chickens, to raise, to raise chickens and, and, and make money in the end. We've lost uh, major poultry integrators in our state and other places because of the difficulty in, in, uh, in feeding the chickens with the high cost of corn and, and soybeans. About 60% of uh, the cost of um, raising a chicken is corn, and about another 20% is soybeans. So that's, that's a tough business when those prices have doubled and actually tripled. They're coming back down, and we're working hard to bring them down further. But these uh, rising costs haven't just placed a strain on the poultry industry. They've made a very profitable business, in some cases unprofitable. Um, that is why that uh, Senator uh, John uh, Bozeman of of Arkansas and I have introduced an amendment to the bill, we hope that we offered and, and adopted, folded into the, the bill, that makes it a priority, a priority at the U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, research operation to improve the, uh, the efficiency, the digestibility, and the nutritional value of feed for poultry and livestock, including corn, uh, soybean meal, grains, and grain byproducts. And by improving the feed that is used to raise our chickens, uh, and I might add other, other uh, uh, livestock, uh, hogs and, and cattle and so forth, uh, we can provide the poultry and the livestock industries with a greater variety of feed choices to use in their operation, which I hope will ultimately help uh, provide some relief to these producers who rely heavily on these commodities in their operation and still provide healthy food for us to, to eat. So um, let me just go back, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, where I where I started from, and that is to, to ask this question, how do we get better results for less money in everything that we do? How do we get better results uh, in just about everything we do for less money or maybe for the, the same amount of money? I think about that every day that I'm here, and I know many of my colleagues do as, as well. The, the bill before us, the agriculture bill, uh, seeks to answer that question and in a number of ways. They do help us get a better result for less money. Not just a better result for the taxpayers, but I think a better, healthier outcome result in maybe reducing somewhat uh, this upward uh, trend on, uh, toward obesity by making sure that uh, a lot of people who aren't eating the kind of healthy foods that they need, particularly fruits and vegetables, uh, that they, they have access to those fruits and vegetables. And uh, on both of those counts, this, this, uh, this legislation helps uh, not just our farmers, uh, who are literally the lifeblood of uh, this country, but the rest of us too, including taxpayers.
So I'll, I'll just wrap up where I started, and I asked the, uh, the question, sort of the rhetorical question, of um, how's the economy doing? And uh, we're still struggling to, to some extent. It's better than it was, but we know that uh, still uh, folks are having, in uh, some parts of the country, including some parts of my state, are uh, having a tough time uh, finding a job, keeping a job, being able to keep their house and make sure that their kids can stay and continue to go to college, make sure they have health care. We know there's, uh, there's challenges and we need to be mindful, of that, ever mindful of that. Uh, I would say though that in terms of moving out of recession, uh, I think the underlying fundamentals for the economy are not all bad and we should keep that in mind. Uh -huh. One of the surest ways to talk ourselves uh, into a, another recession, having just come out of the worst recession since the Great Depression, we can like talk our, our, our way in or talk ourselves into a recession. We don't need to do that. We've seen uh, consistent uh, job growth, private sector side for over, over 24 months, manufacturing jobs for over 30 months. And uh, so we need to, uh, to, to keep a balanced uh, view, knowing that there's still work to be done. The, uh, in baseball parlance, Mr. President, I was talking, and, and this guy up here who follows the Minnesota Twins as their presiding officer uh, pretty, uh, pretty much, and my guess is that we've been joined by the uh, former governor and now senator from uh, North Dakota. My guess is he might be a Twins fan, too, I'm not sure. i give it a thumbs up. Uh, we pull for the Phillies. I pull for the Tigers as well. For some uh, reason, I won't bore you with uh, here today. But uh, we, uh, we need to hit a home run to really get the economy moving. In my view, the home run is a comprehensive bipartisan balanced deficit reduction plan, not uh, unlike the Bowles Simpson deficit uh, commission recommendations. My hope is when the elections are over, they'll be over, and we can move and, and, and pass something along those lines before the end of the year. For me, that's a home run with runners on base. In the meantime, there's a bunch of things we can do to hit singles, maybe some doubles, to get the economy moving, to create that nurturing environment. And among the ones that are, uh, really uh, need to be done and finished with are uh, transportation legislation to keep two or three million people working. We pass it here. The House has been uh, less uh, willing to help, uh, help us find a, a good uh, compromise, and they need to. And uh, postal legislation, which really supports an, uh, an industry of seven or eight million people. We passed bipartisan legislation here two months ago. We're still waiting for the House to, to move a bill eight months after they reported the bill out of a committee. They need to get uh, on with that. They did that. You get a, a compromise, a good compromise on bipartisan bill on, on transportation. We preserve those two to three million jobs, free up a lot of money for transportation projects all over the country. That would be great. And on the postal side, help the postal service rein in its deficits, move toward uh, self-sufficiency again, and make sure those seven or eight million jobs uh, remain there and, uh, and the industry strengthens. And the last thing we need to do is uh, find ways, focus every day on how do we get better results in everything that we do. How do we do that? And not just the defense spending, defense projects, not just uh, education, not just transportation, not just environment, uh, not just agriculture, but all the above. And this bill doesn't uh, help us rein in the growth of costs in some of those other areas, but sure does in, with respect to agriculture. It saves us about $24 million, billion, billion dollars above what we'd otherwise spend over the next 10 years. And I think it moves us in the right direction in terms of healthy Americans, Moving us uh, to be a trimmer, less obese uh, population, and a healthier population by virtue of eating, uh, eating uh, our spinach and uh, our broccoli and uh, a lot of other vegetables and fruits. They're going to make us healthier and maybe just a little bit leaner than we would otherwise be. Uh, Mr. President, I think that pretty well wraps up what, uh, what I wanted to say uh, today. And thanks for uh, allowing me to, to do that. Uh, I think maybe I should yield the floor my friend from, uh, from North Dakota, a recovering governor and a good man. And uh, I'm happy to yield the floor to him at this time. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to thank my esteemed colleague, uh, not only senator, but former governor as well. Mr. President, I rise to speak uh, on the farm bill.